It really is an honor to be here, and um, I've been aware of this conference for many years, and Austin and I have been exchanged. I think I've even dropped off scholars here to speak uh, and never had the privilege and, and uh, to be able to uh, be with you. And I really do appreciate the fact that I'm in the room of, uh, with, with extraordinary minds and organizers and activists, and, but also people who really think about this scholarly intersection with the way we do our work and the way we think about our work and research. And so what I'm going to propose is I, I know how I feel at the end of the conference and, uh, and a, a day long set of uh, workshops. So I'm going to try to abridge so that we can have some time to engage. I would love to hear some of your thoughts about some of the things that perhaps um, I can throw into reflection or things that you've been reflecting on uh, throughout the day are things that trouble you still, are that things that uh, you know, raise questions about the intersection, particularly at this juncture between research and you know, applied interventions, whether that's through activism, through programming, through a range of social service uh, you know, spectrums that we can think about. Uh, but let me, let me start with a couple thoughts and reflections. Um, around 100 years ago, in a neighborhood not far from here, uh, Lawndale, west side of Chicago, a Polish Jewish merchant who was very engaged with, at that time, a predominantly poor working class Polish community, Polish and Jewish community, was struggling to find adequate access to not only good health care, but health care that was also provided in a way that allowed the Jewish community, those who were keeping kosher, to have a facility that was consistent with their spiritual values. At the time, the only other ho uh, hospital not far was Michael Reese, yet that would have been established by a much more integrated, upper middle class German Jewish population who was more explicitly secular and disconnected from the tradition in ways that was off-putting and alienating for this more working class Jewish Polish community. From that effort, this merchant purchased a, uh, a facility that was closing, named after a scholar that I think is both relevant to Muslim Jewish traditions, Maimonides, and um, started what is now known and celebrated as Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, 100 years later, is perhaps one of the leading health facilities of its, of its kind um, that provides extraordinary care for um, populations that are often struggling. The community that Mount Sinai was positioned in on the west side, particularly during the 70s and late 60s, quickly went through transition as the Jewish American community is moving up into the northern suburbs and predominantly becoming a African American low income community. They had to make the decision at that time whether they would leave or whether they would stay. And there were board members who said it would be economic suicide to stay. But there were others who pushed that the values the Jewish principles and values of tikkun alam, healing the world, being healing agents that cared for whoever walked into their doors, demanded that they stay on the west side. And they stayed. Not only did they stay, around seven years ago, when another health facility started by an extraordinary group of Catholic nuns, sisters, sisters of Kashmir, again around eight miles west of us in the Marquette Park neighborhood where Iman you know, has been thriving and working for many years, um, a health facility called Holy Cross. And that facility was thriving for many decades, but like not many hospitals, came on some extraordinarily hard times and was about to close. And not only did their closure mean lack of access, they were one of the highest levels of trauma uh, in terms of volume in the city. But also, it also meant for communities like the ones that Iman is working in and the ones that our organization like mine have committed our, you know, our tenure to would mean yet another empty, huge facility in neighborhoods who are economically already depressed and, and struggling with quality of life issues. 
out of all the facilities in the state of Illinois to move in to find ability to help rescue this hospital, it was Mount Sinai that came to the rescue. Again, not an economically wise decision by any stretch of the imagination. It didn't add up in terms of dollars, but it added up in terms of value. And if you go to Holy Cross, not only did they were able to rescue Holy Cross, and now it's part of the Mount Sinai system, they allowed Holy Cross to retain its Catholic spiritual cultural values. I start with that, and I was at the 100 year anniversary sitting with former CEOs and presidents of that, reflecting on that, because a couple weeks ago, on in the thick of a site visit from feds called an operational site visit for an, a lookalike, we were notified that Iman, the Inner City Muslim Action Network, became the only organization and only entity medical facility in the entire state of Illinois that won the fully federal qualified health center designation. Now, I was notified of that on September 11th, around 9.30 in the morning. And it was an interesting moment that even the reviewers could not refrain from commenting about the profound symbolism, a day that not only was horrific for all of us as Americans and all of us as human beings, but certainly a day that has come to become associated with all of the issues of surveillance and scapegoating and stigmatizing and all of the issues that uh, not only Muslim communities but black and brown communities have had to struggle with ever since. That on that morning, in a Trump administration, the only organization awarded by the federal government in the state of Illinois, a fully qualified health center, was one with the name Inner City Muslim Action Network, that in its application, not only never refused to not only refrain from celebrating our name, but we refused to not be absolutely transparent about everything we did, that we were organizers, that we were artists, that we were committed to a holistic intervention around health, that we had moments of art therapy, that we had spiritual notions of therapy. We never hid that from the feds. And there we were being acknowledged at the most significant level on that morning. Both those vignettes, both those moments that have had recent for me, I think are reminders, I think, about values that are undergirding this gathering. That whether it is our interventions informed by good data, good research, or whether it's uh, our research and data that's being agitated by folks in the community for more practical, relevant interventions, that dialectical relationship is one that is naturally filled with important tension that I'm sure some of you have been exploring. Wherever we are on that, what those vignettes, I think, tell us, again, is we as American Muslims not only have nothing to hide, but everything to celebrate and bring to the table when it comes to who we are, our traditions, our values, our spiritual compass, that we have an extraordinary both history, we have an extraordinary diversity, we have an extraordinary uh, 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 level of brilliance in our community. We are disproportionately represented, in, as everyone knows, in the medical field. Yet, in a city like Chicago, we still don't have the Muslim-led Mount Sinai or the Holy Cross. Our hope and prayer is that Iman's health center emerges as something that everyone can take ownership of and celebrate in the same way that even a non-Jew like myself can sit and authentically, on basis of just spiritual goodness, celebrate an institution like Mount Sinai, or celebrate an institution like the Holy Cross, and appreciate what these sisters of Casimir, or what the Jewish Polish peasants, that their ability to stick to their spiritual principles and allow it to inform their care, because because of those institutions, today thousands upon thousands are able to walk into those doors 
and in other places and receive dignified quality of health irregardless of ability to pay. And when we think about this tradition, when we think about what we're bringing to the table, we're bringing a tremendous history. You know, I know everybody in this room has probably talked about how many and how often the contributions of people like Ibn Sina have to this larger set of conversations. But I think it's worth thinking about again, that it's not, you know, irrespective of the accuracy or the historical, you know, uh, and, you know validity of any of the kind of propositions he was putting forth in the, in the field of medicine, he's still widely regarded beyond those things at, for something that I think has been at the center of this conversation as the first who really brought evidence-based research to massive compilations who was interested in that. That the, the American, that the Muslim civilization produced individuals hundreds of years ago that were interested in empirical evidence in thinking about interventions, even as they were connected to a metaphysical reality that had no direct empiricism that could ultimately explain that. Of course, we know in our tradition, لَأَلَّكُمْ تَفَكَّرُونَ We know that you know, this idea to, do, to, do, to think and to reflect is part of who we are and to engage and invite us in that. Yet we also know that we subscribe to things that are part of the ghayb, the unseen, that have no empirical data that will ever improve. And part of those things have direct implications on health and wellness of human beings. And that is this area we need to continue to navigate. And, and one would suggest that we are more well positioned to do that than any other community. And I would contend that. Listen, you know, my journey, and it's interesting being here at the University of Chicago as we think about some of these conversations because this intersection of data and intervention and the debates that it produced, you know, for someone like myself who, you know, was always, have, have always been, you know, I'm not happy if I'm not in the thick of things and sitting in a rigorous academic program, had, I had my moments here at the University of Chicago where fun comes to die and, you know, uh, and where this extraordinary, you know, isolated campus from, you know, that's been struggling with its isolation as we're doing sociology and thinking about that. And it was interesting because I was, I rebelled against it even as I came here, even as I felt privileged in being one of the most, you know, so premier sociology programs in the, in, the, in the country. I struggled, I struggled with some of the, you know, sitting in classrooms and listening to yet another you know, analysis of something that will have absolutely no relevance to the lives of which the peoples whose studies are the subjects of those, you know, of those volumes of studies. Yet there was something that I thought about while I was here that kind of eventually led to a paradigm shift about how I appreciated this and how it helped me navigate and embrace the tension with a little more um, humility and a value for what I eventually saw it providing me. You know, I thought about the story of, of people like Jane Addams um, here in Chicago, who in many ways was the quintessential activist and organizer who was engaged. But what I didn't know so much about Jane Addams until I, and, and her link to sociology was in many ways, it was Jane Addams who, who went to, of course, East London and saw the extraordinary squalor. It was a very privileged person, comes back and decides to do this thing, not without critique, by the way, uh, by many in different sectors, this whole house, to serve the poor and to engage the communities and the immigrants as they were coming. Yet, as she was engaged in that work, there, she was pushed from all levels. The efficacy of the work, the outcomes of the work, the theoretical implications of that work. And it wasn't until many years later, I read her 100 years at Hull House, or the, 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 the uh, 20 years at Hull House, and on the centennial, and I thought about many of the types of things that she was wrestling with. She was literally having debates with Marxists about whether her programs were actual liberation or perpetuating oppressive conditions. She was getting great conversations with, as she should, critiqued by you know, the, the Frederick Douglasses of the world at that time, who were challenging her on racial assumptions and whether she was going far enough. And she, they would, she would open her living room for those type of conversations. Meanwhile, she was being pressed about pragmatic 
considerations of a program. And someone like Jane Addams, a little side fact, among the little things that impressed me the most about Jane Addams in, in this particular, if you haven't ever read this, is that at one point, she was so in need of resources for programs. Anyone that's worked in the nonprofit world, you know, that hasn't changed much, right? We're constantly chasing down resources for the extraordinary needs. And for someone like Jane Addams, they were real. She wasn't vacant. She lived there. She experienced it every day. Her reality was Hull House. She saw the needs of the women. She saw the needs of the families as they were coming. And there was a very affluent donor who gave her a $50,000 check, an equivalent today, several million dollars. Yet they found that that donor had sundry practices with women and she gave the $50,000 back, right? As a person who was also interested in not only programmatic outcomes, but the ways in which we think about our work. But the other thing that's directly relevant for here and for me, when, and again, that was a, a moment of extraordinary insight, was Jane Addams really helped to popularize the first community study tracks. Because at some point, they wanted to really study the longitudinal effect about issues around health and poverty in and around the whole house area. Those study tracks became the inspiration of early, early journalists like, Robert's Park, like Robert Parks. Robert Parks goes on to become the founding chair of where? Sociology at the University of Chicago, informed by those very methodologies. Sociology at the University of Chicago goes on to becoming the most preeminent sociology department in the world at the time, that in many ways is considered the, to help birth modern sociology, modern sociological inquiry into issues around poverty and assimilation, into the correlations between you know, uh, density and the number of the areas, all those various community studies, informed by an activist who was concerned about the outcomes of their work. So the symbiotic relationships between research, between reflection, between medi meditation and intervention are part of a rich tradition that I think we both have in the larger Muslim you know, civilization and also in our current realities. I think about that as I think about what it's going to take to intervene in the current moment. Because I think about that revelation for me was a critical one as I began to think about the value of being able to step back, not only to think about empirical analysis and evidence-based analysis, but also having the tools to do the theoretical explication of those things. Where is that data coming from? Who's reviewing that data? Who's thinking about the terms with which the data is collected, right? What settings? And begin to have the, the tools, the intellectual tools, as well as the spiritual tools to interrogate all of those things. Not also help to inform the way I was doing work at Iman, but help to inform the type of interventions I would be making in, in my academic research, which eventually led, quite frankly, to the ability for me to have enough of a footprint in the department where people took me under their wings and said, we know Rami's the unconventional student. Up until today, I, I never attended one job talk, never attended one dinner event at my department. And that was not what you did if you were serious about the department. Yet, the type of work I was doing and the type of attention it attracted among some of the scholars who really appreciated it gave me the type of, uh, I think, protection I needed to help allow me to navigate my way through that. And so it's always, for me, coming back here, it's always a reminder of that. And now I get invited to think about that intersection between activism and research here by the department chairs and thinking about my work and what it's, what it's instructed us. Let me say a couple things about the current moment and open it up for conversations and thoughts as, as you've wrestled with things. I, again, think that the larger premise of what I'm laying out, I hope, is what has been the undergirding theme here, which is our community should be poised and ready to wrestle with the both evidence-based research kind of approaches as well as, again, the practical implication, sustainability, and institutionalization of these efforts. 
one without the other, again, research without the real well thought out ability about where it's going, how it's going, quickly becomes irrelevant and kind of, you know, obscure material for journals that maybe five people in their spouses, if they're lucky, will ever read. For those of you who've published in journals, right? Read it, please, read it. I, I don't know what you're saying past the first sentence. Like, what language is this, you know? It really sounds good, <laughs> right? Big inflated terminology and words and you're stuck in nomenclature that, you know, you even forgot what really means. <laughs> Yet the type of activism that doesn't step back from itself, the type of implementations that doesn't step back, ask the questions and tap into the privileges that come with space and analysis, is also as irresponsible and quite frankly reckless. And not only could lead to the wastes of, of funds and support, but in, in my case, and I've seen it, to some of the very severe outcomes and consequences. This is a moment, we take Chicago for example, and I don't think this moment is unique simply to Chicago, but obviously this is the reality I inhabit. But you know, Iman's in Atlanta, we see it firsthand there. But we take, for instance, the School of Medicines uh, at New York University. Some of you heard about the study that came out recently about the life expectancy gap between two neighborhoods in a city that are less than seven miles apart. One, Streeterville, which is right downtown. If you ever you know, end up by Northwestern Medical Campus, Streeterville. And the other, just two or three miles uh, west of us here, right in the heart of Inglewood. Um, the gap expectancy is 30 years, life expectancy in those two neighborhoods. The report goes on to suggest that the 30-year gap between the neighborhoods is the largest in the country. According to NYU researchers who examine life expectancy in neighborhood in 500 biggest US cities, based on data that they collected from the CDC from 2000 to 2015. Now here's the interesting thing for me. I take that same time period in very different studies, 2000 to 2015, and let's, let's pull together other data sets. You, the, the Chicago Tribune not long ago was doing a study on violence and did this historical kind of thing about violence and also in, in talking about violence brings up a really important point. We've had several, we know that this has been a pervasive subject of conversation. For those of you who don't know, we've had three distinct spikes of violence in the city, probably in the last 50, 60 years. And each of them correlate with extraordinary variables that any kind of person who's doing any even topical sociological analysis can look at. One around 73 at a tumultuous moment, COINTELPRO tearing down gangs, you know, much of the intervention, the beginning of uh, displacement of a lot of black and urban, uh, black, and, black and brown uh, communities are in terms of pov impoverished communities, displacements of industry and, and jobs at that time. Another one in the late 90s, at a moment that really corresponded with a very intense policing effort that was trying to take out gang leadership across the city of Chicago and did so without putting anything else in its place. And then most recently in 2016, when we spiked around 700 plus. Now here's the interesting correlating data point. Between 2000 and 2015, the Tribune goes on to report that the number of poor people living in neighborhoods with extreme poverty, the ones most likely to have the conditions to foster this violence, grew 384%. Now you can go on. A recent study called Wealth, Violence, Health, and Poverty in Chicago, Harvard Public Health Review, goes on to talking about the thinking about the epidemiological approach to th of violence in the city. And thinking and s concludes with notions that we are in a path that will sustain and deepen levels of violence due to oppressive conditions. This is in a health review, not in a Marxist sociological or critical race theory analysis. This is in journals around health and wellness. 
One last study I'll mention is, you know, I was just with some of the, the, the folks who've, and I think you've done work for them, awesome ISPU. Recently they published a report about what's happened to young Muslims, particularly in that same time period, around issues related to behavior and mental health, and the chronic degree of stress, anxiety, that young Muslims who've been growing up in post 9-11 America are dealing with. Why do I cite all of these as I think about the current moment? That again, I think about the ability to integrate data, the ability to think about the ways in which they speak to one another, the ways in which we think about their correlation with holistic health, wellness, and healing. Clearly interventions, structural interventions around housing, around education, around access to good food, around the ability to create spaces where people feel dignified, have correlations with health and wellness. Clearly, issues of mass poverty and chronic poverty have extraordinary correlations with health and wellness. Clearly, mental health issues and larger political social circumstances are related. And I think there are few communities in the United States right now that have the ability to navigate this intersectional, a sexy word, non, no, undoubtedly, in philanthropy and organizing circles, but a word that I think many in our community have understood long before it was even admitted into popular usage. That we understand and, and women can speak to the layers of violence that they experience in homes and its connection to poverty or issues of surveillance and people feeling like they are targeted. African Americans in a city like Chicago that are coming home from 30 year prison sentences and struggling in the same neighborhoods that they were arrested in with no jobs and no opportunities and then find themselves surveilled and thrown on police cars can tell you of course these conditions correlate to my ability to thrive. And finally, not only do I think we have the ability to integrate these data sets and create spaces for robust conversations, but come up with creative, not only evidence-based, but spiritually rooted, sound interventions. I'll end with this. This morning, like every Saturday morning, anytime in Chicago, my source of refuge is back at Iman, where I gather with anywhere from 20 to 30, uh, mostly brothers who are uh, often coming home from long prison sentences, are young guys who are caught up in the cycle of violence, mostly Muslim, not all. And we pray Fajr, we do a little dhikr, and then we get in a circle and we share with one another what's on our hearts and minds and what we'd like each other to pray for. And then we have breakfast. I was reminded this morning by a young boy, one of our brothers, as he listened to an older brother by the name of Red Cloud, who came home from 43 years of prison recently, was diagnosed with um, lung cancer right when he came home, and was told he may also have prostate cancer this morning, yesterday. Conditions undoubtedly connected to the institutions in which he has lived for the last 30 to 40 years, prisons across the state. Yet Red Cloud has on his last treatment of chemo for the, the lung cancer and feels confident. And although he was very anxious about the diagnosis, he was told that, the, that it was a mild and possibly even non-alarming uh, issue, perhaps for the prostate, needed a second opinion. Most importantly, what contributed to Red Cloud's state of mind and health was the ability to sit in a circle like he has been ever since he came home from prison and said, without this circle, not my doctors, I would be dead because I would have given up. And his story resonates with the truth that I think many of in this room understand, that it is the spiritual value coupled with our interventions that really are the one, things that are going to carry the day. And that we should always be, irrespective of where we are on the spectrum of our religiosity, or the spectrum of our practice, a community 
that values and that unapologetically celebrates this extraordinary tradition and what it has always meant for a different type of healing. When they came to the Prophet at the end with this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they had some of his companions a concern about huzn and sadness and depression. The Prophet didn't shoo them away, didn't acknowledge that didn't exist. But among the things he said, he gave them a dua. La ilaha illa. He said, make the dua of Yunus. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Inni kuntum min adhalimeen. Years later, it's a dua that we make sitting in these circles. We reflect on the power when you feel overwhelmed by huzn and sadness and anxiety. The, the insight of that dua. The first part of it is an acknowledgement that no matter what I'm going through, at the end of the day, it's only me and my creator. La ilaha illa anta subhanak. Nothing else really matters. That affirmation is the ultimate affirmation. And then the second part of the dua, which is an interesting question to ask, why would the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, prescribe wa inni kuntu min mean as a medicinal intervention of sorts for depression. And it's interesting when you hear behavioral health Therapists, as I hear often in our center, as they sit in circles, art circles, spiritual circles, talk about being able to own and master the things that are over you and not to feel like you are completely subservient to them and acquiesce to them. And so the Prophet is in fact saying, listen, some of the things that oppress us are ourselves. We occasionally oppress our own souls and the insight there is not to beat up on us but to be able to give us the ability that if you are the person that occasionally oppresses your own soul, it's you who can liberate your soul. And that insight is a beautiful spiritual insight that is as relevant 1400 years later with all the extraordinary achievements in behavior health that we should embrace with all the evidence-based research about what types of various interventions can work because what we have seen is time and time again when we stick to those principles and those spiritual insights that researchers continue to and, and we're engaged with the serious project of opening our doors to thinking about the actual value that we will find not only value for our communities and those that we touch, but a type of intrinsic value for the larger society. And this is important as we close out to say this, because I think sometimes we have these conversations from the standpoint of what it means as we stand upon these principles for our larger society. And I think what we lose sight of when we engage more holistically, and this is, I think, a point that I hope is also being circulated in your conversations here and for the rest of the day tomorrow. That the ability to have this conversation and to take up the challenge to be relevant in a series of conversations that are happening in the larger medical field. And I think, again, that's what I value most about this initiative is that in order to do that, we have to be formidable. We have to be cogent. We have to be able to engage our interlocutors in a way that is compelling with the same types of kind of tools and technical insights that you would expect from any uh, high level workshop of these kind. But as we do so, and we understand that one of the values in being able to apply this across the board is as we learn from one another, I know that Iman's ability to be a source of hope and light, not unlike Mount Sinai and uh, the Holy Cross, is that People from all different walks of life and faith begin to see our values and communities in ways that are connected to real physiological, mental, and spiritual healing. And that is real. And that is not only relevant to those who were engaging outside of our community, but in some ways even more relevant to those inside our community. Last story, I promise, and I'll close. I'm like a pastor with five different endings. But I'll say this. Juma, this last Juma, I saw, you know, at Iman, we have Juma, and a woman came up to me who I've seen before back and forth with two severely autistic children who come to Iman for behavioral health all the way from Tinley Park. 
And on one occasion, she needed a place to pray. And I said, well, we do the prayer here. We have a small little musalla so you can go pray. And she said, is it okay to bring the children? I said, of course. I didn't think much of it. After Juma, some of you have been to our Juma. After Juma, there's like, you know, there's artistic expression. There's a little farmer's market stand that we have. It's very lively. And people come from all the neighbors, the church. Like, you know, it's, it's a very, it's always a cross section of very different people that come. She followed me and found me and said, I want to blame you for being here from Jummah and coming all the way from Tinley Park to this Jummah. I, and she said it jokingly, and she was speaking in Arabic. And I said, why are you here? She said, I'm here because this is the most comfortable place I've been for my children. Right? That I, as much as I love the development in Tinley Park and these some of them masajid, I would never bring my children into a musalla there, two old or severely autistic children, without fear of what people may say to them or how they may look. And it made me realize that the type of environment we seek to create as we engage others, sometimes we lose sight of how relevant, first and foremost, it is to those even closest to our own communities that are looking for spaces that are nurturing, that are celebratory, that are non-judgmental, that think about health in the most holistic sense. And I pray that all of you in all of your extraordinary work continue to do that in one capacity or the other and through your work that we all receive that type of collective healing. Thank you so much. Assalamu alaikum.